Hello and welcome back. I'm Raj Kletke and today we'll look at a western pale evening dunny emergence that I fished for the first time this past year. In this video we'll look at how my fishing actually happened, not at how my fishing should have happened. I made many mistakes. In the next video we'll look in depth at my mistakes and review mayfly entomology as it applies to the western pale evening dun and show how better knowledge of that entomology should have prevented me from making many of these mistakes. Of course, my experiences are anecdotal. My solutions may not always work for you, but the basic entomology discussed in the next video will give you a tool to help some of your fishing situations. Incidentally, the majority of the pictures I'm using in this video are not of the actual location mayflies or trout that I saw. So, let's get started. On a beautiful sunny but cool day, my fishing partner and I were fishing a slower section of the Bitterroot River in Montana in early September. Over the years, we had fished this section numerous times in September and felt we knew what to expect and how to fish it throughout the day. While waiting for the trichos in the morning, I saw midges scooting on the surface, but there were no rising trout, so I just waited for the female trico emergence. They were very late, and adequate numbers of emerging trichos to get fish rising didn't occur until after 10 a.m., the very latest I've ever seen. The spinner fall didn't really get going until after 11 a.m., but then lasted past 1 p.m. in the afternoon. When the fish stopped taking even the sunken trico spinners, we started preparing for the blue-winged olive emergence that commonly we would see on cloudy days. However, after that afternoon was still bright with very few blue-winged olives, and the trout seemed to ignore them. We saw rare, about a size 16, yellowish mayflies in the air, but I saw no rising fish, and even though I wasn't doing any good, I ignored these yellowish mayflies. I felt they might be pale morning duns, which are similar to the eastern pale evening dun and the sulfur dun shown here. A few pale morning duns may still be present in September in this section of the river, but we hadn't seen any pale morning duns earlier, and so I also wondered if could they could be the western pale evening dun, a mayfly that I had not fished before, and knew only a little about. They would have been easy to tell apart had I taken the time to catch one and look at it, but I didn't. Even at a distance, I was confident they weren't western mahogany duns, the Paraleptophlebia bicornuda, which are somewhat similar to this pictured mayfly. We've seen and fished mahogany duns successfully many times in this section of the river in September's past. A little later, while resting on shore, I idly turned over a few rocks and found multiple size 16 clinger nymphs with dark wing cases within a foot of shore in about one to two inches of water. I do carry a magnifying loop and was able to confirm that the nymphs I found were in the genus Heptagenia, which is the western pale evening dun. This pictured nymph is a related clinger nymph, but is a different species. I found no other nymphs. Specifically, I found no mahogany dun nymphs, which are extremely easy to recognize as Paraleptophlebia bicornuta, the western mahogany dun, is quite unique. It is a crawler nymph with tusks. It's the only non-burrowing mayfly with tusks that I'm aware of. As I sat there, a few rising fish could be seen close to shore in shallow water. Even though I hadn't seen any mahogany duns, a characteristic of mahogany duns is that they emerge close to shore, and the last time I had fished this area, I had caught trout on mahogany dun patterns, especially my size 16 Quigley Cripple, so I quickly tied that on and fished to the rising fish near the bank. No hits, no hookups, and no success. I had seen numerous mid midges that morning, and the sun was starting to go down, and one evening a couple years ago I had had very good midge fishing with my size 22 tumblefly, so I tied that on, but again, no success. What about a caddis emergence? I usually think of a possible caddis emergence when I see these listed features. I wasn't seeing any adults, but this emergent was on relatively slow currents, and the rise forms were quite scattered and not at all splashy, more like you'd expect from a sparse spinner fall or a few midges. 
I couldn't find any spinners on the water. I had already tried a midge, and a brief try with a sparkle pupa did no good. I wasn't seen any mayflies either on the surface, but finally remembering the pale evening dun nymphs that I had seen, and with the great expectation that comes with using a favorite fly, I put on a size 16 yellowish quad and fished it to the rising fish near shore. Still no success, not even any refusals, no interest at all. Meanwhile, my fishing buddy was catching fish, he was using a soft hackle and casting to rising fish out in the mid-river, letting the relatively slow currents minimally belly his fly line and adding very short tugs to his fly occasionally. As quickly as I could in the failing light, I put on a similar soft hackle and started swinging it in front of the rising fish near the bank, trying to replicate his technique. Still no success. Getting increasingly frustrated, I moved a little farther out from the shore and started fishing the same soft tackle to the rising fish in the mid-river, just like my fishing partner. I let my fly swing towards the bank. Finally, I started getting some hits, hooked a few fish, and even landed a nice 16-inch rainbow before calling it quits for the evening and walking out in the dark. The soft tackle was a good decision among, amid the many bad decisions I made that evening. I will be using soft tackles again, so let's quickly tie one. If you have an appropriate sized partridge hackle, you can use the classical tie by putting the hackle on first, either by the stem or by the tip. Incidentally, if you're not familiar with some of these fly tying techniques, please please review my series on beginning fly tying or the series on tying with a rotary vise. I wrapped the hackle on the right to show you the final length. It's not bad, but it's still a little longer than I like, so I'll be using a distribution wrap for the hackle. Therefore, I start with the body. Note that I left some bare hook just behind the eye and only took the yellow floss partway back. Essentially, I'm tying a size 16 body on a size 14 heavy wet fly hook. A lot of old classic soft hackles were tied this way. I'm not really sure why, but it does give me a little extra hook weight and a wider hook gap than if I used a size 16 hook, and the fish don't seem to mind. I use the parallel method to take my body forward, tie off the remaining, leaving a little bare hook at the eye, and then cut off the excess floss. Then I put a little tan dubbing on the thread and make a small collar. I often don't use a collar on soft hackles, especially on small hook sizes, but here I would for reasons I'll discuss in the next video. I still keep a little bare hook behind the eye. I'm using a distribution wrap for the hackle. I have to do this frequently. You can see a more complete explanation on some of my previous videos, but basically you cut the stem to create a small V in the hackle, coax the fibers into a flat group, pinch them close to the hook, and use the thread tension to distribute the fibers around the hook. The small bare spot on the hook helps the fibers slip around the hook. I usually put the fibers low on the far side of the hook, but putting them high on the near side also works. Try to adjust the distribution as you move the thread around the hook. When you're comfortable with the distribution, tie off the hackle and cut off the excess. Make a small head and then whip finish twice. I'm also going to tie a beaded soft hackle for next year. I'll explain why in the next video. I'm currently tying some of these with a thorax bead, but I expect the normal bead head would work fine also. After putting the bead on the hook in the usual fashion, I put the yellow floss on the hook like I did previously. I periodically check for fit. On the left, I could still, still slide the bead back too far, so I built up the body more with thread until I could only slide the bead back as shown on the right. I pushed the bead back forward again, tie the thread off with a half hitch or a whip finish, Put on a little glue, head cement, nail polish, whatever you use on the thread, and push the bead back again, leaving a small bare hook in front of the bead. Here you can check the size of your hackle by wrapping it a little. Lately I've 
gone to a little bit longer hackle extending just beyond the bend of the hook. This one would have been okay, and I could have wrapped it in the classical manner, but for demonstration, I decided to do another distribution wrap. It's a little harder with the bead, but with a little practice, it can be done similar to the way I did it without the bead. Work on distributing the fibers around the hook with your thread tension, but also use your non-thread hand to help distribute the fibers. The fish don't care if the fibers are perfectly distributed. When you have what you want, put on a few extra wraps, cut off the excess, and then you can whip finish twice. Here I'm putting on a small head and then I'll whip finish. Even when the fibers get wet and matted, as on the right, you can see how the bead helps keep the fibers flared. I've used the classic bead head in the past, but I really like the looks of these thorax beads and I'm anxious to try them next season. Well, I made a lot of mistakes in fishing this emergence, which you can learn from and which I'll be discussing in the next video. In the meantime, tie up some of these soft hackles. They are one of my favorite patterns and are very useful for many fishing situations, not just the Western Pale Evening Dunn emergence that I hope to fish a lot smarter next year. So join me next time for a better discussion of some basic entomology and a much closer look at the numerous mistakes I made. I'm Raj Kletke, and I'll see you soon.